This is Annie of ByAnnie.com and Patterns by Annie. Thank you so much for joining us today for Live with Annie. As usual, we've started the stream a bit early. This helps us get everything set up and broadcasting properly to our various platforms. You can find a countdown clock on the screen showing how long it will be until we actually go live. While you wait, please connect with us and other viewers in the chat. Let us know where you are from and whether you're a new or longtime viewer. We'll see you live soon. again for joining us for Live with Annie. We are so happy to have you with us today. While you wait for the program to start, we hope you'll enjoy the content playing on screen. There's so much inspiration, so take a moment to tell us what you love in the chat. Don't forget there is a countdown clock on the screen so you know how long until we go live.
it's Annie again reminding you that we'll be going live with this week's episode shortly. There is a countdown clock on the screen showing how much time is left. You've got just enough time to grab some water or a beverage of your choice and a snack and to connect with us in the chat. We'd love to hear what you've been working on this week. It's Annie, back to remind you that we'll be starting this week's live very shortly. We've got a really fun episode planned for today, and we'll see you soon. Hi, I'm Annie of ByAnnie.com and Patterns by Annie. Thank you so much for joining us for Episode 19 of Season 3 of Live with Annie. Today we will be joined by machine quilting expert and author Renee Merrill, who will share tips for free motion quilting on soft and stable. She'll teach you how to find the right stitch length and speed and how to find your rhythm for quilting. She will also share some simple free motion quilting patterns that will look great on By Annie projects, even if you're a beginner. You will love Renee's simple step-by-step -step learning system for free motion success, so stay tuned. Thank you all for making time to be with us today. Whether you are a brand new viewer or if you've been here for all 119 episodes, welcome. We know there, that there are lots and lots of things you could be doing with this time, and it always means a lot that you made the time to be with us. If you enjoy these episodes, please take a minute to follow us wherever you are watching us. And if you know someone else who you think might enjoy the information that we share, we would love it if you'd tell them about Live with Annie. The easiest way to do that is to tag them while you're watching. That will take them directly to the episode so they can watch it too. Also, we love reading your comments, so please be sure to interact with us throughout this presentation. We want to know what you think, and we really love learning from you too. And be sure to add any questions you might have in the comments or chat, and we will do our best to answer them before we close. In our last episode, which was two weeks ago, we focused on helping you make decisions for your sewing projects, from choosing patterns for particular fabrics, to fussy cutting and deciding on designs for quilting on a home machine. We featured a variety of projects made using Tula Pink's new Everglow and Neon True Colors fabrics, which are just hitting stores. If you missed it or want to watch that episode again, remember that you can find all the previous 119 episodes of Live with Annie on our Facebook page, 
our YouTube channel, or at biani.com slash live. We will put up all the links to make them easy for you to find. I'm going to have a quick drink of water before we get going today. So as I said, today we will be joined by free motion quilting expert, Renee Merrill. Renee began quilting in 1989, her first year of graduate school, by hand piecing and hand quilting a king size quilt that her grandmother had been making for Renee. Later she found some nine patch squares in her grandmother's trunk and started using them to make baby quilts for her nieces and nephews. When people began praising her designs and suggesting that she quilt professionally, she brushed off the idea as impractical, but it wasn't long before she was designing fabrics and attending her first quilt show, which was the International Quilt Festival in Houston. It's a great show to start with. Renee says that that show totally blew her mind and helped her not only see quilts in a totally new way, but also helped her learn that she could make a career of quilting. Renee published her first book, Simply Amazing Spiral Quilts, in 2008, inspired by a doodle of a spiral she drew while on a temp job. That book was followed by two more books about spiral quilts, Magnificent Spiral Mandela Quilts and Sideways Spiral Quilts. Free Motion Mastery in a Month, which is Renee's fourth book, along with its toolkit and video, is a shift from quilt design to free motion quilting. It's based on her experience as a pianist and piano teacher. Renee has lots of surefire techniques for getting smooth, even stitches and great quilting, even if you are a complete beginner and much more. So please help me welcome Renee Merrill. Hi, Annie. Thank you so much for inviting me to be on the show. Um, your, your, cheers, you, your, your presence on camera is so cheerful and encouraging. And I just love everything that you have to say about encouraging people to learn to sew and to learn to quilt. Um, you asked me to talk a little bit about my, how I got started with free motion quilting. And it really, um, there was one day where I said, you know, if I'm gonna call myself a professional quilter, I should be able to do my own quilting. And of course I had been hand quilting, but it just didn't have the time to do that anymore. And so I needed to do, learn to do machine quilting. And a friend of mine who is a master quilter said, oh, you know, mark your quilt, make these templates. And so I spent two weeks making templates and marking a quilt and it was an absolute disaster. I don't even have a picture of the quilt. It was so horrible. Um, and I just, I thought, gosh, there's gotta be a different way to do this. And so I said, all right, I'm just gonna sit down at the sewing machine and I'm going to do a block a day. I'm gonna quilt a block a day. And I took some ugly fabric that was in my stash and I started quilting a block a day. And after a week and a half of trying to quilt a block a day, I still could not do this. And finally, I was sitting at the sewing machine one night feeling absolutely frustrated and thinking, why can't I do this? And this crazy thought went through my head and I always listen to the crazy thoughts. They're like the signpost to your life, okay? The crazy thought was, Renee, you're a concert pianist. You already do a lot of really hard things with your hands that are much more complicated than free motion quilting. So you can do this. And it was really amazing because my piano brain started talking to my quilter brain and the two of them started exchanging information. And suddenly everything that I knew about practicing the piano and everything I knew about teaching the piano came into play and I started to be able to quilt. Hey, Jake, can you pop up that picture of me at the piano? He's got a picture of me there. No, nope. okay. There's a picture of me somewhere in there of me when I was about 10 years old sitting can in a giant. Oh, statue. I'm sorry. They're having, I think Jake Casey came back because I think they're having trouble with the feed on something on Facebook. Uh oh, okay. So, um, so Jake All right. wasn't on listening. Go. Yeah. That's okay. Sorry, sorry about, about that. She was wondering about putting up That's the picture right. of her at the piano. Oh, yes, of course. So do you have, does, he have the, uh, does he have the pictures of the moonflower quilt? The moonflower quilt? 
Alex's quilt. Oh, there's the piano. Now which one? Okay, so there's me when I was about 10 years old sitting at the piano. I love it. And then, so, so these blocks that I just thought, oh, you know, they're just going to be ugly blocks. I'll make them into hot pads or just chop them up or whatever. After a while, they looked pretty cool. And so I decided to go ahead and make them into a quilt after all. And so uh, you can, Alex, if you can queue up Alex's blocks. Can you queue up Alex's moon moonflower blocks? There we go. Okay, so these were the practice blocks that I was quilting on. And the next picture will show you next the quilt picture. that I made with the blocks. Wow. So I kind of I kind of jokingly call this my FedEx quilt because it's purple and orange. Um, and I actually gave it away to a son of a friend of mine who was 16 at the time, but he was learning how to make electric guitars in shop in, in um, high school. And the teacher was teaching him how to do like wood inlay. And so he really appreciated fine work. And when he got this quilt, he said, wow, that's sick. Which is about the nicest thing a sixteen-year-old boy can tell you. Right? <laughs> so, anyway, um, so after going through that whole process, I started thinking about how I would teach free motion quilting. Could I use this day-by-day -day pro process to teach free motion quilting and build a quilt out of the blocks that were left over? And one day, as I was traveling from one event to another, the thought popped into my head that really there are six shapes that build all quilting designs, um, a straight line, a C curve, a circle, a teardrop, an S curve, and a spiral. And uh, I think we have a picture of the tracing sheet with the six basic shapes on it. These basic shapes became the basis for learning how to do with quilting. It's like, if you can quilt these six shapes, you can build them into any pattern. And so Are you looking for that? I started putting together the book and here we, there, there we go, six basic shapes, that's it. And that became the first tracing sheet in the tra in the book. So Free Motion Mastery in a Month is a, it's a day-by-day, step-by-step practice plan. Think of it like, we can kill that photo now, Jake. So think of it like this. You know, if you were taking piano yeah, lessons, you've got a, a lesson book that told you, you know, what to practice each day. Well, Free Motion Mastery in a Month tells you what to practice each day. And the reason that that's so important is this. Um, First of all, uh, if you practice if you practice wrong, you just get good at doing it wrong, right? Or you just get nowhere at all. And so many people try to practice free motion quilting by just sitting down at the machine and trying to sort of flounder around. And what happens is you're learning a lot of different skills all at once and your brain can't process it all and you just sort of end up getting stuck. Um, so what this does is it breaks down those skills into a, three steps that you do each day. And you do, and what's really important about these three little exercises, and the funny thing is you don't even do them at the sewing machine at all, okay? Um, so what's really interesting about these three exercises is that um, they incorporate motion, okay? And that's the thing that really makes the difference between free motion mastery in a month and pretty much any other way you wanna learn free motion, whether you're looking at a book or a video or even sometimes in a class, um, your eyes don't quilt, your body does. And so your body has to learn to move to quilt. And so these exercises, and we're gonna do some, okay? Um, but the you have to learn to move to quilt. And so Free Motion Mastery in a Month does these three little exercises that train your body to move to quilt. And what's really amazing is that instead of it taking days or weeks or months to learn a pattern, it literally takes minutes. And uh, my students are always amazed because they think that, you know, it's going to take them forever. And they walk out of class on their first day of quilting, having like done all these patterns and they're all the way up to doing feathers already. And they're just like, wow, I never thought I'd get this far this fast. But it makes what makes the difference is how you practice. You can't practice Mozart and get Bach, right? So I give you a day by day practice plan for exactly how to practice, starting with basic shapes, um, starting with straight line designs and working you all the way through the six basic shapes up to feathers. And it's funny because people will walk by my booth at shows and they'll scoff oh, in a month. Well, honestly, give me a day and I can have you do free motion quilting um, with confidence. Um, and it's really fun just to see people succeed at this. I just, that's, that's where I really have 
such joy as in just seeing people be able to do something that they couldn't do before. So what's happened now is it's just become so popular and I'm, you know, whether I'm at shows or at guilds or at stores or whatever, I am on the road constantly. And, you know, I've always loved to travel. It's a good thing that I do because <laughs> that's pretty much all I do these days. Hard it was. So what? I know how hard it was to um, pick a date for you to be on our program. So we were really glad that uh, we were able to get you to come. And, and again, your busy schedule is just a sign of how effective your techniques are for quilting. I really loved hearing about your background as a pianist and a piano teacher. And I can see how those skills would translate into machine quilting. So I can't wait um, for you to share all of your tips and tricks for doing that and teach me those exercises. I can tell I need to do those too. So I'm just going to turn this over to you, Renee. It's, it's all yours. Thanks, Annie. Okay, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of tell you what we're gonna do and then do it, and then we'll recap it at the end. Um, so first of all, I have to show you the scariest words that a quilter ever hears. All right, quilt as desired. Ah, okay. I right. Okay, that's how we feel. It's like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Um, and so whether you are a beginning quilter or maybe you can do some quilting or maybe even if you're an experienced quilter, but you just need ideas, um, I'm going to give you some ideas in this program that will help you get past that ah, feeling. Okay, So I'm going to teach you how to set up your machine and you know, like just learn the basics of free motion quilting. I'm going to give you a specific exercise that will show you how to get the perfect relationship between the speed of your hands and your speed of your machine so that you have a smooth, even stitch without ever thinking about it. This is like game changer right here. And then I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna teach you some simple patterns that anybody can do, even if you're a total beginner. Um, they look great on Annie's bags. I'm gonna show you some bags that I've made that um, I've used these patterns on. And then uh, at the end, I have a little hack to make binding easy and i know like that's another thing that so many of us dread we hate binding oh my gosh binding is the worst thing so um this is a little hack that will make it a lot easier so let's dive in so the first thing you need to do when you're doing a biani bag or any of my quilts right um, because what? Because I have you quilt a block a day, right? So you need blocks. You need sandwiches to quilt on. And so the very first thing is like, this is Annie's soft and stable. Okay. Um, this is what she recommends. Oh, look at the, there, get the glare off of there. This is what she recommends for doing her bags. And I hadn't used it before. And I was a little skeptical, honestly, because um, I thought it might be too stiff or, you know, too thick to quilt through. But this stuff is great. Um, I love the stability. It really makes it easy to quilt because you don't have a smushy fabric moving around. It just stays really solid. And it's got kind of a grippy surface. So I didn't even have to pin it. Honestly, I really didn't. I, I, I didn't pin anything. I didn't baste anything. I clipped. And then once I got going, I just got rid of the clips and that was it. This is really cool stuff. Um, so for bags, this is wonderful because it's got that stability. It gives you the stand upiness um, that Andy talks that Annie talks about. But if you're making a quilt, you don't want something this stiff. So my absolute favorite batting, if I'm doing a quilt, is Hobbs Heirloom Fusible. Now this is a double-sided fusible batting, and it's Hobbs's eighty, you know, eighty percent cotton, twenty percent polyester batting. It's their use, their regular batting, and it wears like iron, but it's super soft and drapey. But the the fusible means that you can just fuse all your layers together. Sh nothing shifts, nothing moves, um, and it's just a dream to quilt on. And then the secret is that once it's quilted, it's designed to let go. So you're not going to have stiffness from your from your fusible once you get done with your quilt. Once you start moving it around or you wash it, all that stiff, you know, all that little 
bit of stiffness from the fusible goes away and you have nothing but a soft drapey quilt. So this is all the batting that I use anymore for quilts. I just love this stuff. It's super, super easy. And it's a dream even for bigger quilts because you can just work on it and kind of fuse it section by section in a small area. So this is awesome stuff. Okay. Um, oops, my little list here. Menopause and COVID. I, my, my brain's fried, so I just have to keep track of things. Okay, I have to write them down, right? So um, I'm gonna ask Jake to pop up some pictures here while I'm talking about stuff next. We're gonna talk about setting up your machine for quilting. Now, if you are an experienced quilter, this is stuff you've already heard. So, but pay attention anyway, because there might be something that you learn, okay? The first thing you need for free motion quilting is a free motion foot. There's a lot of different styles out there. And the thing that you want to watch for over and above any other thing is a foot that will give you a good, clear view of your needle. This is my favorite foot. It's a Bernina number 24 foot, and I love it because it's slim, it's streamlined, and I can look right at my needle and see exactly what's going on. Um, so check with what you already have in your machine, check with your sewing machine manufacturer, find yourself a good free motion foot. And if you're not sure what to get yet, use the one that you've got and try it out, and then you'll see whether you like it or whether you wanna find something else. Okay. The next thing you need to do is balance your tension. And um, I have a little figure that I use to do this. Jake's gonna pop up a, a picture of the cup. Up, oh, that's the dropping the feed dog. So, yep, sorry. Jake, you're in, you're doing, thank you. So this is a little button on my Bermina. You just push it in and the drop, feed dogs drop. This is why it's called free motion because the feed dogs are not moving the fabric for you. The machine is not moving the fabric for you. You are moving the fabric freely in any direction you want to go. Okay. Then once you've dropped, got your, your, mo your foot on and your feed dogs drop, then it's time to balance your tension. And now Jake's gonna pop up page 87 out of my book. And I'm gonna show you the little figure that I use for balancing tension. Okay, so if you look up there in that upper right-hand corner of that page, you see a little thing that's kind of has a couple of loops in it. There we go, he even zoomed in on it. Thank you, Jake. So what I do is I stitch in from the edge and make a loop in one direction, a loop in the other direction, and then go backwards off back to the edge. And what this does is it tells, it checks to see if I'm skipping stitches in any direction. It checks forward, right, left, and backwards. And if I have any skipping stitches in any of those directions, this is going to tell me immediately. Then the next thing I do is I turn over, I look at both sides of the quilting. Jake, will you leave that page up there? Great. And what I'm looking for is if my tension is balanced. So if you can see that little figure down in the bottom left-hand corner of what's showing, you want your, your top thread and your bottom thread to come in and hold hands in the middle of your batting. And so that you don't see your top thread on the bottom and you don't see your bottom thread on the top. If that's not happening, you're going to see one of two things. Now Jake's going to scroll this up a little bit for me. There we go. Okay, so if your bobbin thread is pulling through to the top, like the diagram you see there on the left, then we've got to adjust the top tension, the top thread down. And if your top thread is pulling through to the back, like in the diagram on the right, then we need to adjust the top thread up, okay? So this is when you look at your quilting and you look at your sample, if your thread's out of balance in one of these directions, the key question to ask yourself is, which direction do I need my top thread to go? If your top thread needs to go down, like the diagram on the left, then you take the numbers of your um, tension setting and they need to go down. That's why that little number sign is right there next to the down arrow, okay? If your top thread is coming through to the back, you need your top thread to adjust up. So you're going to turn your tension dial or adjust your tension setting so that the numbers go higher. So that's why you see the little number with the arrow going up. The top thread needs to go up, so the numbers need to go up. Now, if you have a long arm um, that does not have, or an older machine that doesn't have numbers on the tension, then just think about the face of a clock and turn the knob in the direction that the numbers would be getting higher on the clock or turn the numbers, the knob in the direction that the numbers would be getting lower on the clock. And the same thing applies. The other thing that that little figure will tell you is if you're getting eyelashes on the back of your thing, the, that little figure has a 
It'll tell you if you're getting what's causing your eyelashes. There's two things that'll cause eyelashes. Either your tension is out of balance. And if it is, your tension will be out of balance on the straight part of the figure. Jake will scoot back up there to the top of the page. Okay. So if you have eyelashes around this, they always happen around the bends. So if you have eyelashes around the circles, if your top thread is out of balance on the straights, then you know it's your tension that's causing the eyelashes. If your stitches are balanced on the straights, then what's causing the eyelashes is that you're moving too fast and you will also see long jerky stitches around those circles. So it's one of those two things. Either it's your tension or your hands are moving too fast. Fix, fix one or both of those and you'll have perfect tension. Boom. So just a last little note about tension. Check it whenever you change anything. Change your thread, change your bobbin, change your needle, change your fabric, change your batting, change your mood, change the time of day, change the weather. Because think about it, thread will be thinner and slidier when the weather is dry and it'll be thicker, fatter, stickier when the, wet, when the temperature, when the weather is humid. So any combination of those might throw your tension off a little bit. So I just use this little two second thing. It literally takes two seconds to stitch this thing. And I check my tension whenever anything changes because you know what? I'd rather spend two seconds checking my tension than two hours picking everything out. So, and I've learned this from experience, I tell you. All right, so the next thing we need to do now that we've got our tension balanced is to find the right speed between our hands and our machine. And this is my, this is the money shot, ladies. This is the thing that is going to rock your world, okay? Beginner quilters make the mistake of thinking that in order to get the right stitch length, they have to change the speed of their hands. And you know, somebody will tell you you're supposed to quilt fast and somebody who tells you you're supposed to quilt slow. Well, what is fast and what is slow? Maybe fast is fast for them, but it's slow for you. Or maybe slow is slow for them, but it's slow for you, fast for you. There's no, you can't tell. Here's the thing. We all have a natural, comfortable hand speed already built into us. And what we're going to do is find that comfortable hand speed and then adjust the machine so that it stitches at the right speed to match your comfortable hand speed. You get that? We're not going to change your hand speed. We're going to change the machine speed. Okay. So there's two ways you can do this. Um, one is the best way. <laughs> if your machine has a little speed adjustment slider bar on it, you're gonna use that slider bar to set the maximum speed of your machine and then you're just gonna floor your foot pedal, okay? Don't try to up and down your foot pedal and change your speed. Just let it ride and let the machine do the steadying for you, okay? If you don't have a speed, or bar, a speed adjustment bar on your machine, then yes, you're gonna to have to adjust the speed of the machine with your foot pedal. All right, so with that out of the way, now it comes to our hand speed. And I have a little video that um, Jake is going to play for you that's going to show you how to do the first part of what I call my Indy 500 test. Okay. Um, so, Jake, can you run that video? For the Indy 500 test, stitch right down the middle of your block with your fat machine going as fast as it can, but move your hands at the speed that's comfortable for your hands. You're going to stitch forward and then backwards about a finger's width away and then forward again. Here we go. Don't worry if your lines wobble. It's going to be perfectly okay. However it works out, I'm going to do one more and since I started a little bit to the left, I'm going to scooch over to the right a little bit. And there we go. Thanks, Jake. So what you do when you've done this part is you look at your stitch length, okay? And we want 12 stitches to the inch. That's 
you know, that's a, a good, comfortable stitch length for quilting. So if you, you're either going to have one of three things, either you're going to have teensy tiny little stitches, or you're going to have great big stitches, or you're going to have just right in the middle stitches. It's kind of like Goldilocks, right? So if you have teensy tiny stitches, the solution is slow down your machine because what's happening is you've got a whole bunch of little stitches that are crowding into a, the space, okay? Don't move your hands because don't change your hand speed because that's your comfortable hand speed. And by the way, that comfortable hand speed is going to be about the speed that you do when you're piecing, okay? So if your stitches are tiny, slow down your machine so that it will match the speed of your hands. If your stitches are really long, then you're going to speed up your machine because right now what's happening is your hands are going through there and your machine's going slow. So you're getting a long distance between your stitches. So you want to speed up your machine to match the speed of your hands so that you're getting that 12 stitches to the inch. Okay. Just, and so after you've done this first test, then go back and adjust your machine, do another line, adjust your machine and do another line until you hit in the range of 12 stitches to the inch. Now, please don't obsess about this. Okay because you're gonna be a little faster and a little slower. You're probably gonna be a little wobbly and that's okay. We just wanna get in the ballpark so that everything's, you know, so that we've got that comfortable speed and your machine's doing what it needs to do to give you that 12 stitches to the inch, okay? That is, I, I hope you'll go home and try this. It is magical how well this works. Once we get to the, once we do this in my classes, even if you're a beginner, nobody ever thinks about their stitch length again and they just quilt along with a smooth, even stitch because you're working at your comfortable, natural hand speed. Okay. We all have it built into us. Just use it. All right. So the next thing that I want to talk about is gloves. Okay. Now, I don't like gloves. And for years, I have used these little shell, squares of shelf liner, I call them grippy pads. One of my students came up with a great idea to cut a slit in it like this so that it'll stay on your fingers. And uh, I think uh, Jake has a picture of grippy pads. That's what I look like when I'm sewing with my grippy pads. Okay, Love these things. They're awesome. And you probably have shelf liners sitting around your house that'll do them. If, it's, if I do use a glove, these are my favorite gloves. There you go, the Swan Amity glove. And what's fabulous about these gloves is you see the little pillows right here in the palm. What that does is it lets your hand be slightly curved, but it keeps full contact with your fabric so that you still have control of the fabric, but your hand is relaxed. Absolutely wonderful gloves. Okay, Swan Amity glove. All right, with that, we are set up ready to quilt. All right, and we are going to do some movement to get that going because guess what? You already know the perfect rhythm and speed for quilting. You just don't know that you know it, but you're going to know it in about two minutes. Okay. So just remember that free motion is about motion. Your body has to have the right rhythm and speed to quilt successfully. All right. And guess what? If you have kids and you've done this, you recognize the fussy baby rock, right? Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to turn this into free motion quilting practice. You're gonna take your hands and put them in a W like this. And it's really important for this that you link your thumbs together because that way your dominant hand is gonna train your non-dominant hand and it's gonna help you get more coordinated faster, okay? Then we're gonna put our hands level so that our fingertips are at the level of our elbow. And now we're gonna air quilt. Glide and stop, glide and stop, glide and stop, glide and stop. That is the perfect rhythm and speed for quilting and you've done it your whole life. I find myself doing this in the grocery store line, okay? It's like, oh, I wish this grocery store line would move faster. Oh, wait, I'm practicing my free motion quilting, okay? Now, the other part of this that's important is that when you get to the stop, you have to wait for your machine to take two stitches because that's how it anchors a sharp point. So it's glide and stop, ch -ch -ch, glide and stop, ch -ch -ch, glide and stop, ch -ch -ch, glide and stop, okay? Now, you, next time you sit down to practice free motion quilting, you're gonna hear me in your head going glide and stop, ch -ch -ch, glide and stop. But believe me, that rhythm is the perfect rhythm and speed for about 90% of what you'll ever quilt, All right? Now, there's another thing to keep in mind about movement and quilting and rhythm and speed, okay? And it's this. Free motion quilting is exactly like riding a bicycle in this one way, okay? If you're on a bicycle and you go too slow, you wobble and you're gonna fall over, right? When you're doing free motion quilting, if you see your line start to wobble, it means you're going too slow. 
just like riding a bicycle, you need a certain amount of forward motion in order to have a smooth flowing line. And so if you're moving at this speed, this glide and stop, glide and stop speed, the glide is fast enough to give you a smooth line and slow enough to keep you in control. And I call that the bicycle principle. If your lines wobble, you're going too slow. If you're losing control of your pattern and your stitches are really big, then you're probably going too fast, okay? But then just come back to this rhythm, glide and stop, glide and stop. And that will get you right back in the rhythm that you need to quilt. It's so easy, it's so great because we've already learned this. It's, you know, it's like all those times that we stood there and rocked the baby. You didn't know you were practicing free motion quilting, but you were. Okay, so. As you go through the lessons in free motion mastery in a month, you're gonna quilt one 11 inch by 12 inch block each day. And the reason for that size is just because you take a yard of fabric and you cut it in 12 pieces and it works out to be 11 by 12, okay? Um, you can be, you know, you can make bigger, little bit bigger blocks if you want to. Annie's really good in her patterns at telling you what size fabric you need to quilt, but she breaks it down into pieces that are manageable in your sewing machine. So if you're doing a by Annie bag, then just work with the size of fabric that she tells you to work with. She's even built in a couple of, you know, inches of wriggle room around the edges. So you're gonna be fine with that. So, so as you're going through the lessons in Free Motion Mastery in a month, all the patterns are each based on one of the six basic shapes. And you'll learn about 50 patterns, including a bunch of feathers as you go through it. And you end up, like I said, you quilt a block a day. You end up with a stack of practice blocks. Okay. And Jake's going to bring the camera back onto me so you can see my stack of practice blocks. There we go. Okay. I have mountains of these around my studio. Okay. <laughs> they just seem to multiply in my drawers. So what I did a couple of years ago is I said, you know, I don't want you to waste these practice blocks. And if you look at the book, you'll actually see the quilt over here. That quilt is actually being made at, in the book. You can actually see it step by step as I'm making it. But you know, I keep making sample quilts and I still, and I have practice blocks. So I started making patterns that are based on a 10 inch pre-quilted block. Okay. So these other quilts that you see here behind me, the heart and the stripy one over there, those are two of my patterns where you take your practice blocks and it doesn't matter if they're pretty or not. Okay. They're quilted. That's all that matters. And you square them up to 10 inches and cut them up in pieces and put them back together. And you end up with a really gorgeous quilt. So, um, so, so these blocks are really great for some of Annie's smaller projects. And so I, you know, when I started off making samples for this, I just grabbed some of my practice blocks. And this right here, this project bag, I have to get, there we go. Get on the right side. There we go. This thing is backwards. So I, <laughs> so anyway, this, the background of this was a practice block. And this little strip down here was a piece of a practice block. And you can see, like, it's kind of messy quilting. It doesn't matter. Um, but this was perfect. It's the perfect size to fit inside my backpack. And all of my cords for my projector and everything go in there. So now I have this really nice, cool bag that just keeps everything organized. And I love it. So this is going right back in my, back, in my backpack as soon as we're done here. And you can see the other side of this, too, by the way. That's what the quilting looked like when I was practicing. Okay. All right. Let's see, some other things I did. This is a um, little clamshell bag. I did two of these. These are just the right size to be made from a practice block from Free Motion Mastery. I even did, this one I did before um, I saw Annie's pattern, okay? And you can see right off the bat, I did not use her soft and stable because this gets squished and uh, hers stands up. But that's a great bag with two. And I'm gonna show you some other things that I made with, uh, a little bit later, but I just love her little, like the quick zip cases, that's a great pattern. The project bags, that's a great pattern. Um, and I like, when I say great pattern, I mean like great pattern for little small projects that you can make with your practice blocks. So I had really a lot of fun making these. There we go. I had a lot of fun making these. They're quick, they're easy, and they're really, really useful. Okay, so. When you start through the book, the first thing you do is you quilt, quilt large print blacks and you outline the design, just like I did that first day when I was trying to learn to quilt. And so 
this is a great way to quilt your fabric for Annie's bags. And I'm gonna show you a little example of this, okay? This is her packing cube, put it over here, okay? And what I did when I quilted this is I just stitched around the design in this wonderful cave facet fabric, okay? And I put a solid fabric on the back and look at the gorgeous quilting that I get on the bag. I get the same pattern and it coordinates with the design in the fabric. This is such an easy way to quilt your fabrics for your bags and it looks fantastic, okay? So that's, and what's really cool is like, you can decide which side you wanna use. I debated whether I should put the pretty flowery stuff on the inside or whether I should put the plain green stuff on the inside. And I finally decided that I wanted to look through the lid and see the flowers. So that's why I put that on the inside. Okay, so I'm gonna teach you the pattern that I start out with when I'm teaching beginners, and it really comes right out of that straight line, that um, glide and stop pattern rhythm I taught you a minute ago. Um, and I'm gonna introduce you to the process of what happens in a free motion mastery in a month lesson. So, um, yeah. Um, so the very first thing we do is something I call quilting yoga. And you can watch these videos on my YouTube channel, Free Motion Mastery in a Month on YouTube. And they're all there. And here's what we're gonna do. So this, I call this pattern straight line stippling. And it's very, very easy. We just put our hands in there and we start doing this back and forth thing, right? But instead of just going back and forth, we're gonna go in random diagonal lines. Glide and stop, 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 glide and stop. Now the next exercise, so that's the first exercise you do in the lesson. Then the next exercise you do is you trace it with the trainer tool, which you're gonna see in a video in just a second, and then you draw it. The tracing teaches you muscle memory and coordination and the drawing helps your, map, your brain make a map of the design so that it can tell your hands where to go. So um, Jake, can you, can you cue that up? Here it comes. Um, we're looking the for the after. tracing and drawing video. Yep, that's it. Okay. After doing the quilting yoga exercise is to do the tracing exercise. Um, what the tracing exercises do is it helps you develop muscle memory by going through the motions you're going to use at the sewing machine before you actually go to the sewing machine. So to do that, you're going to use a tracing sheet. This is one of the 10 tracing sheets that's in the toolkit. And we're going to, and we're going to use the trainer tool. Um, and we're gonna focus in on straight line stippling right here because that's the pattern we're trying to learn right now. So I'm just gonna zoom in on that a little bit. So what we're gonna do is take the dot that's in the middle of the trainer tool and put it at the start point of the pattern. And then just put your hands, <laughs> I zoomed in so much you can't see, hold on a second. You put your hands either like this if you're gonna do a domestic machine or this if you're practicing for a long arm machine. And what you're gonna do is actually move the dot along the line so that your hands are mimicking the motion that you're going to use at the sewing machine. So glide and stop, glide and stop, glide and stop, glide and stop. Now remember I said that when you get to a sharp point you wait for your machine to take two stitches so you anchor the point, right? So this is a perfect example of practicing that. Glide and stop, 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 glide and stop. And then you go back and do it in the opposite direction. So the whole idea is to get that rhythm and the pattern kind of married together. Then the next step after this, since you've already started to get familiar with the pattern here, is you're going to draw it. Let me just move this out of the way and bring my drawing in. Now, when you draw, you don't want to fall, I don't want you to look at the pattern because the whole point of drawing is to develop a mental map of the design. So if you need to start by tracing it on the tracing sheet, you can, but the goal is to come over to the trace of the paper and draw it without having to follow a pattern. So in the case of this one, it's really easy because it's just random diagonal lines in every direction. So glide and stop, glide and stop, glide and stop, glide and stop. Glide and stop, glide and stop, glide and stop, glide and stop. So what drawing does is you'll notice first off that your hand is not 
um, working with the other hand. There's only one hand working here, not both of them. So this is not helping you develop muscle memory. And that's a kind of a common fallacy that a lot of people have about drawing, they think that it's gonna teach them a pattern, but actually you're not doing the motion that you're going to use quilting because you're not using both hands. So it's not teaching you the motion of quilting. But what's really important about drawing is that your brain makes a map of the design as you're drawing so that it can tell your hands where to go. And so this is a really important step of getting ready to be able to quilt the pattern. And now when you go to your fabric and quilt it, You've learned the pattern and you're able to quilt it. All right, so I won't, I actually didn't get a sample quilted with straight line stippling, but I think you understand enough of what you need to do from that, that you could go to the machine right now and find yourself uh, some fabric and do straight line stippling. Fill up a piece of fabric of it, for it, with it, of it, for it, with it. Fill up a piece of fabric with it, cut it into a beautiful little piece of fabric to use for your biani bag and make it up and it'll look great. Okay, now I wanna show you a quick uh, other, another, um, another straight line pattern that is super, super easy and you're not gonna believe this is easy. Um, but let me show you, I just, here we go. All right, my little clamshell bag here. I call these Chanel diamonds. It looks like Chanel, right? This is a really, you know, you know how much people pay for Chanel bags with this kind of quilting on them? Ladies, we can do this, all right? So look at this, because this has a single line of quilting for each one, and then on the other side, it has triple lines of quilting, and they're perfectly even and straight, and I'm gonna show you how to do that, okay? So um, the trick to getting grids perfect is not marking them, it is masking tape. And so with that, I'm gonna ask, Jake to pop up a series of pictures and I'm just going to walk you through this technique really quick. You're going to be amazed at how easy it is and how great the, the results are. So there's our little bag with the single stitching and going on to the next picture. So you lay, of course, you layer everything together and then going on to the next picture. Go ahead and put your template on there and mark the outlines of your template. Mark all the lines that Annie tells you to mark okay? and then go on to the next one. You're going to take a ruler and you're going to mark a 45 degree line. It doesn't matter anywhere. You can, you can put this anywhere. It doesn't matter where, but just mark a 45 degree line across this as your starting line. Okay, next picture. There's, there it is without the ruler. Going on. Now here's the key. You see that wonderful blue painter's tape? This stuff right here is like the best thing in, very invented for marking grids. So now we're gonna to go to our sewing machine and we're going to sew along the edge of the tape. You can use any width you want, okay? Sew along the edge of the tape and just keep moving the tape over and line it up with your last line of stitching and you're gonna get perfectly even straight lines, okay? Next, I think the next thing is a video, Jake. Is that the video? Here we go. Look how quick and easy this is. and you just keep working across your fabric like that. How cool and easy is that? That's just super, and it looks like that. It looks absolutely perfect this way. And you know what? You can even use your feed dogs when you're doing this. And the great thing is the tape is gonna stabilize the fabric a little bit, so it's not even gonna to tend to kind of crinkle and pull between the biani surface and the tape. I didn't, I, I, you see this? I did not baste or pin this at all. Going to the next picture, I'm going to show you how to get those wonderful triple lines. There's my finished one on to the next picture. Okay, how to get these wonderful triple lines. If you look at these, you'll see they're perfectly, perfectly even and perfectly, perfectly straight. And here's how I did it. Next picture. Okay, look at the needle in this picture. So you see how the line of stitching is still lined up to the center line on my foot, but the needle moved over three clicks to the left. So as I sew this, I'm gonna keep the center line of my foot on the line of stitching, but the needle is going to be perfectly spaced to the left of that. And then I go back to the next photo. Uh, then I go back one more time and I move the needle to the right and I still keep the center line of my foot along that first line of stitching and I get perfectly spaced lines to the right. 
ladies, it could not be simpler. I should see it, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm sure there's a few of you guys out there. This could not be simpler. You can do the most gorgeous grid work and it's like a no brainer. It's so easy with masking tape and clicking your needle from left to right. So there's the finished result. Doesn't that look awesome? It was so easy to do. And by the way, this fabric is a new line of fabric from Kaufman called Sheen. And it has this wonderful glittery surface on it. It's so much fun to work with because it looks like expensive, you know, vinyl or leather or whatever. And it's just as easy. To, it's just cotton. It's so easy to sew. Okay. So I'm going to show you one more pattern here. Um, going on to the next picture. I'm going to show you my pink little, my little pink clamshell bag here. Okay. And what I want you to see on this one is do you see the flower that I kind of did right in the center of the bag? And I even did it in the thread to highlight it so that it would, you know, pop out. Okay. So this is the, actually when I do a class, this is the second pattern I teach. Um, I call it the C curve daisy. And all it is, is glide and stop, glide and stop in little curves. And it just, you keep the petals the same size and you just work your way around. So we've got a, uh, let's see, we've got, let's see. Okay. So Jake's going to, Go to the next picture. So there's my my layered up block going in the next picture. Mark the the template on the fabric. Next picture. And then I'm gonna take, I took a blue water soluble marking pencil and I just put a circle where I wanted the daisy to be. And just remember to keep it about half an inch from the edge of the fabric so that you don't lose part of it in the seam. Okay. Next. There we go. Um, so this is a video, right? Here we go. You're starting in the middle of your fabric. It's really important to pull your bobbin thread to the front so that it doesn't get caught in the bobbin race or get stitched into the quilting on the back. So to do that, we're going to position the needle where we want to start and then just do one stitch down and up and pull on the top thread. When you do that, you can see it pulls through this loop of bobbin thread right here. Now grab that loose of bobbin thread and if you keep it under the needle just use your seam ripper or something sharp and small to grab that point. You don't want to stick your fingers under here because it's, you, I've had people in classes actually stitch through their fingers that way. The other way you can do it is just pull it over here then grab it with your fingers and then shove it back underneath the starting point where your needle is going. Okay now that I have my top threads on top, my sorry my bobbin thread on top, I'm going to start stitching by taking four or five tiny little stitches, not on top of each other, but very just close together, because we all know how hard it is to get those stitches out when we have to use the seam ripper. And then I'm going to just clip my threads away there. And I'm ready That's to start. That's how I lost the stitches. So the C curve daisy is just making petals all the same size, just little half circles as you go around. Glide and stop, glide and stop, glide and stop, glide and stop. And you want your machine running fairly fast for this so that you'll get small stitches that will give you nice round curves. And just keep bumping around. Notice I'm not getting, I'm not letting my petals get larger. I'm keeping them the same size and just letting the points drop wherever they drop. And I'm just going to keep bumping around like that until I get out to that circle where I've marked my placement of this flower. When I get to the end, I'm just going to make four or five tiny little stitches there again to lock it in, and I can clip off my threads right at the surface of the fabric, and I'm done. So this brings me to the next topic I want to talk about, 
which is fussy quilting. Okay. Um, it's a term that I just made up since I started looking at Annie's patterns and working with them. But it means that if you're looking, you know where the places are going, where the pieces are going to fit on your in your bag, and you quilt something to highlight that space. So as you can see, what I did here is I'm fussy quilting this flower so that it's going to show up on the face of my bag. And um, can we pop off of that? There we go. So here it is on the face of my bag right there. You can see it, it's fussy quilted so that it pops out. And you can do this with metallic thread or whatever you want, something that's kind of contrasty and really pops that note, that, um, that design off of the quilting is just really, really beautiful. Okay. Now, there's another thing you need to know about fussy quilting. And sometimes, and I'm gonna show you the edge of the um, packing cube, okay? Here's the edge of my packing cube. And actually, I actually think we have a better picture of this so you can see a really good picture of it. But Jake, can you pop up the uh, packing cube 3A picture? All right, so while he's, there we go. There we go. So what I did with this is Annie said, you know, sandwich this strip, it's gonna be this big and then eventually you quilt cut it down to a smaller size well i wanted to put these beautiful feathers around the edge of my bag so i took that strip and i marked three eighths of an inch first i marked the outside dimensions of the finished strip and then i marked three eighths of an inch in from each side where I knew I needed to leave room for the seam allowance because I didn't want my feather to get hidden in the seam allowance. Okay. So then I stitched along the cutting the the cutting line, the, the outer dimension line. And I what I know that what's going to happen when I quilt this is that everything's going to shrink up just a little bit. And so what happens is um, once this is uh, quilted, I'm going to go cut, I'm going to use my ruler and I'm going to still cut to the dimension that Annie says to use. And what happens when you've done that is the outside dimension line that you quilted, that you stitched around there, is gonna pull in slightly. And when you cut, your cutting is gonna be a, about an eighth of an inch bigger than the line, and you already have your edges sealed. And you can skip that step because you did it before you quilted. Now, I'll give you a little heads up on this one. And I, I learned this after I sewed the bag. Be sure to read the pattern first and find out if there's any place in the pattern, like in this, where you are told to trim after it's quilted. Because if I had realized that, um, Jake, can you pop me back onto live? If you look at the bottom here, so after you put attach the strip to the zipper, you have to re-trim this so that the zipper strip is three and a half inches wide. And when I did that, I lost a little bit of the quilting on this edge. So if I knew, if I go back and make this now, I would leave five eighths of an inch of space here. So I have room to accommodate that trimming. But you know what? It still looks great. I mean, look at that. I'm so proud of this. I just really love how this turned out. There you go. So that's how you do fussy quilting on a strip. All right. So everything's all put together. It's time to put the binding on. I'm gonna show you my favorite binding hack. Two, two quickie binding hacks and I'm turning it back to Annie because I probably talked too long anyway. Okay. So Jake, can you pop up um, binding one for me, please? Okay, so here's the thing. If you're working with a fabric that is the same on both sides, either a through dyed fabric like a Kona cotton or a batik, it, you don't know which side is the front and which is the back. And if you're like me, you have sometimes sewn your strip together and you got it a seam or two that's on the front instead of on the back. And that's really annoying because then you have to go back and take it apart and sew it. So my little fix for that that I came up with is that you press the binding strips in half before you sew them together. And that way you always know which is the outside and the inside then, because obviously the outside of the fold is the outside and the inside of the fold is the inside. And then there's no confusion about which is the front and which is the back and you will never mix up your seams ever, ever again. Okay, so that's binding hack number one. Um, now I'm gonna show you binding hack number two. And this one, I came up with this one about 
a year and a half ago. And oh my gosh, it makes finishing my binding so much easier. So Jake's going to go on to the next photo. Okay. At the beginning of my binding, I create what I call a docking zone. So what happens is you cut your strip from upper left to lower right. No, upper right to lower left, just the way it is in the picture here. And then you fold under a quarter of an inch on that diagonal cut edge, and then you fold your strip in half. So you have this open triangle right here, okay? And then you just go ahead and sew right over it when you start your binding. You don't have to leave a tail here. You just sew right over the docking zone and hold it into, into place. Now we're going to go to the next picture. When you come back around at the end, what you do is you cut your strip so that it fits into the docking zone. So it's a little bit longer um, at the top so that it tucks underneath that folded edge. And then the, the, uh, the raw edge, just make sure it's just short of where the fold hits the seam. Okay. All right, last picture. And you just go ahead and sew that into place. And then when you turn your binding over, you just pull that tight. You don't need to stitch it, okay? You just pull it tight. And when you stitch your binding into place, it stitches into place and nobody will ever know it's not sewn. Just make sure you pull it nice and tight. And it's so easy to do this. You don't have to mess with those six inch ends and trying to get the light, you know, the everything the right length. And oh my gosh, it's just so, I used to do that all the time and it was a headache. This is like slick and easy, one, two, three, quick and done, and you will love it. So in fact, I will show you Here's the back of my biani bag, and you can't even tell where those joins are. Okay, that's how slick and cool this is. So there you go. All right, so there we go. We've gone from setting up your machine all the way through to quilting your project and finishing it and putting on the binding in a very short period of time. And with that, I'm going to turn this back to Annie. All right. Thank you so much. That was so much good information. I um I especially loved the tips on the tensions and that little double loop and thing makes so much sense because you can exactly see where your eyelashes are and where your stitches aren't the same. So that is something I'm definitely going to remember there. I also really appreciate it that you showed how to put the needle down and bring that bottom thread up because there's nothing more annoying than having that whole little thread nest down there on the bottom. So yeah, great, great tips to share there. And I, I have to say, I really want to um, dig out some, make some samples and practice some clam ups with some of those designs that uh, C curve Daisy looked like. It's, it's just kind of like you say, it's meditative and you've got your natural rhythm and it just looks like it would be something very relaxing to do. So I know that I many of our, go ahead. If, if, you, if you wobble the, the petals then it, and stretch them out a little bit, it makes a rose. Ah, great. Yeah, I was thinking a mom, it, you know, and following the designs like on Cave's fabric is such a great mm -hmm. idea because you can get the rhythm of how those flowers are. And then when you're ready to do it on another plain fabric, you know, you've already, like you said, you've got, you've learned that design. So lots of really good mm -hmm. tips. I know that our viewers are going to be really interested in your books and your materials and your classes. So can you give us a little bit about um, information about how they can get your toolkit and all those other things? Sure. Um, just go to free www.freemotionmasteryinamonth.com and or just Google Renee Merrill. I'll come up either way. Um, and my online store is there. My class schedule is there. You'll be able to see where my online classes are and when they're happening. You'll see where I'm teaching in person at shows, at guilds, or whatever. Um, just you can order right online and have it drop shipped to you. Uh, if you, I always encourage people to look at your local store and see if they have it. And if they don't, tell your shop owner about it and ask her to order it from you. We really love developing relationships with stores and helping them bring this to their customers. Um, again, again, if you want to watch the quilting yoga videos, they're all on my YouTube channel, freemotionmasteryinamonth.com. And I think that's all. Did I forget something, Annie? You're much, no. you're much better at this than I am. So tell me I, about I, missing something. I think you hit them all. One thing that I was going to mention is if you do want to Google um, Renee's name, 
her her spelling of her first name is a, and her last name actually are a little bit different than what I thought when I tried to type it in. So Renee is R A N A E, and Merrill is M E R R I L L, right? Yes. So thank yeah. you for so, that. So if you're going to do that, I didn't see it come up on the screen, so I wanted to make sure that, um, that you have that. And thank you again for um, recommending that they check at their local quilt shops. Um, we always definitely um, suggest that that's the first place to look to. But it's great having your website and being able to go watch all the videos you have there. So let's move on and see if it, um, we've got any questions um, from viewers. So one question was, um, do you offer online classes? And I think you've already covered that, that if they just go to your website, they'll find a link right there. And you've got classes coming up, one tomorrow, you said, and then another one starting in July, right? Right, the the Quantum Leap, that's the six hour, learn how to quilt in six hours um, is July 11, 12, and 13. It's three nights, two hours a night. And uh, last time I taught this, a lady got to the end and she said, it's like a miracle. I never thought I'd get this far this fast. So you will That's, you will quilt, learn to quilt faster than you ever thought possible. That's so exciting. And I really appreciate that you showed using them on our projects because I know a lot of people, a lot of times on our larger bags, we'll say quilt like two or three sandwiches, but a lot of people take the individual pieces and I can't wait to see people taking those six different designs that you've done and you know combining them to make different things and doing something different on each section so i'm looking forward to seeing lots of pictures in our photo contest coming up with with some of your designs in there another question that someone asked is do you quilt on a domestic machine or a long arm or do you do it on both i live in new york city which means i don't have room for a long arm but every chance i get to use somebody else's long arm i do um, that said, I'm not even home very much. So what I travel with my Bernina 440 domestic machine in a, in a case, I have my whole quilting studio in a little about 20 by 20 case that with my everything in it, even my projects fit in there. And that's what I use. Um, but I, I had a handy quilter suite 16 for a while and I love that machine. That was a great machine to work on. Uh, I sold it because I'm never home to use it. So the just kind of by default, the machine that I use all the time is my Bernina 440. But, you know, there's a lot of great machines out there and you can quilt on anything. I have taught free motion quilting on everything from a featherweight to a gamble. So That's it, awesome. you know, it's not the machine, ladies. It's like just finding how to learn and just use the machine that you've got. And it's practice. You know, you didn't learn to drive a car in a day. You're not going to learn to machine quilt in a day, but you can learn in a month. And like you said, in six hours, you're going to learn a lot, but it's, it's, you know, it's it that using hours. your natural rhythm and finding that and then and then going with, with that. That's such a good tip. One last question was, what is the number of the presser foot that you were using? I think you said 24 on the free motion foot? Yes, uh-huh, it's a Bernina, and I think they actually call it a darning foot, but it's a number 24 foot. 24 foot. And then when you did that straight line quilting, that was just your regular number zero foot, wasn't it? Yep. That's just yep. whatever your, your regular machine, you know, whatever basic foot your machine does. I think I might've used my quarter inch foot, but it'll work with anything just as long as it has a center line. It needs a center mark so you can center your line along that mark. That was such a good tip. So thank you for sharing that. So um, Randy put up a note, said this was a great presentation, lots of really nice comments and thanks for you. So make sure Renee, after we're done to go in and read the comments. And if anybody's got extra questions in there, um, please feel free to leave a message either. If we can't answer them, uh, we'll get in touch with Renee so that she can. So thank you again for making the time to be with us today. Uh, you shared lots of great tips and I am definitely going to um, do some practicing and unwind with some little quilts um, practices at the end of the day when I've got um, a few moments to spare. So thank you, thank you. And um, I don't know, are you going to be in Houston this October? Will I see you there then? I will definitely be in Houston. Yep. And uh, I will look forward to seeing you there. All right. Sounds great. Thank you so much for joining us and we will look forward to seeing you again.
Thank you, Annie. Bye, everybody. Happy quilting. All right. I hope you all enjoyed Renee's presentation and that you will take advantage of her fabulous training materials and her classes. She really has a lot of knowledge to share, and I know you're going to enjoy um, learning and practicing with her techniques. So we have just a few announcements um, to make. Actually, just one, I think. We want to let you know that we are going to be vending at the H&H &H Americas show in Chicago on June 21st to the 23rd. This is a wholesale show, so it's not open to the general public, but we will be interacting with local quilt shop owners from around the world. And we are really busily working on some new patterns to announce at that show, so please be sure to remind your local quilt shop to attend the show and come see us. We will be in booth number 133. All right, if you have watched very many Live with Annie episodes, you know that we are all about supporting local quilt shops and we really love showcasing shops around the world each week. So today we are visiting stores in Wisconsin, Louisiana, and Germany. So we're going across the border to um, Germany. We're going to start in Racine, Wisconsin at Sew and Save of Racine. Since 1984, Sew and Save has been offering the finest sewing machines, sewing accessories, notions, threads, quilting fabric, classes, and repair service in Racine and the surrounding area. Their large fabric gallery is Racine's only quilt store, and they carry a wide variety of fabrics, including batiks, flannels, and quilting cottons from Moda, Northcott, Andover, Bendertex, and many others. New patterns and books arrive daily and their selection is continually changing, so stop in or check their website often. Sew and Save of Racine features Elna and Janome sewing machines, and James Diebler, the shop owner, is their show sewing machine superstar. He has been in this business for 39 years and he knows sewing machines inside and out. Jim and his specialized repair department tune up and repair all types of machines, old and new. Karen Jensen Potter, the business manager, has been involved in quilting, sewing, and all things crafts for over 40 years as well. The store's large classroom is filled daily with sewing socials, sleep-in-your-own-bed retreats, and beginning and technique quilting classes, as well as community service projects. The store provides in-store classes as well as Facebook Live and YouTube events, and you'll find a listing of all in their calendar section on their website. Sew and Save will be participating in the Wisconsin State Shop Hop through the entire month of June, and they'll also be hosting a Biani Trunk Show during the month of June with a special Trunk Show event on June 7th and 8th, so be sure to mark your calendar for that. Customers who voted for Sew and Save of Racine in this year's contest praised the store's friendly staff, great service, and selection. Catherine wrote, The employees are great. They are always ready to help you. They have a great selection of fabrics and sewing machines, and G Jim Diebler, the owner, is great at explaining what the different machines are capable of doing, and he won't oversell. Lori added, the shop owners and employees are so friendly and helpful. Let me clarify, they are authentically friendly. And Phyllis recognized the store's outstanding staff, new and exciting fabrics, and a variety of crafts, quilting, sewing, and stitching. They're very active in the community with donations and special and events. Sew and Save really sounds like a great shop, and I really loved learning about all the fun events they have planned. So be sure to check in, stop in and check out their Biani Trunk Show during the coming month of June. Next, we are going to Monroe, Louisiana to visit Fat Tuesday Fabric and Gifts. So owners Suzette Sawyer and Lucy Holtzklass opened the store a little over two years ago after they'd had a difficult time finding Louisiana-themed fabrics. So Fat Tuesday Fabric and Gifts now has the biggest collection of Mardi Gras and Louisiana-themed fabrics in North Louisiana, if not anywhere. Both Lucy, Lucy and Suzette are former Mardi Gras queens of the crew of Janus in Monroe, Louisiana. So you can see how Mardi Gras and Louisiana-themed fabrics come into the picture. 
They have since branched out to include other fun and vibrant prints and have a brick and mortar store along with an online store. Lucy is more into quilting, whereas Suzette is more into fun projects. No matter what, they always enjoy sharing their shop and fabrics with everyone. And although they are a very little shop, they have a great selection of bright and fun fabrics and are continuously making room for more. Fat Tuesday Fabrics and Gifts will be participating in the Northern Exposure Shop Hop that started May 29th and goes all the way to June 24th. This shop hop includes 13 shops in North Louisiana, Arkansas, and Mississippi, and features blocks from each shop to create a mystery quilt. The shop also sends weekly emails every Tuesday at 2 p.m. The Fat Tuesday at 2 email features different specials, deals, and sales that are valid from 2 to 10 p.m. on that particular day. They also send out emails on Thursdays featuring online weekend sales. In addition to Suzette and Lucy, the store staff includes Deneen Wisecarver and Andy Salinas. Suzette and Lucy wrote, we are very thankful for their dedication to the success of our little shop. I always love learning about new places and Fat Tuesday Fabric and Gifts sounds like a very interesting little shop to visit. So be sure to stop in and check them out and tell them Annie sent you. All right, the last place we are going to go today is Dinslock in Germany to Quilselberry, the regional winner for Germany in this year's LQS contest. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right. I tried to listen to um, some of their videos and I couldn't catch the name, so I'm doing the best I can. Ina Mag Magadans is the heart and soul of this fabulous shop, and she has been fueling it with passion for over 20 years ever since she opened it with her mother, Andrea, who long had a dream to open a creative shop. Together, they ran the store for many years until Andrea lost her battle to cancer. After a time of grief, Ina opened, reopened the shop and decided to not only keep her mother's legacy alive, but also to reinvigorate it with a modern spirit. She created a place where creative minds come together to plan their next colorful endeavors and find respite from an increasingly fast-paced and stressful world. It's a brick-and-mortar local quilt shop and creative sewing center, as well as a reliable to supplier to many customers all over Europe through its web shop. The store is filled with thousands of fabrics, a vast selection of notions, yarns, and suppliers for crocheters and knitters, and the full range of Biani bag making supplies. The Quilsaw Berry staff is a diverse bunch full of creative spirit with the desire to help and pass along their knowledge. Ranging in age from teen to retiree, they strive to inspire and help their customers, many of whom have become good friends over the years. They are dedicated to being a knowledgeable team on the cutting edge of the industry, and they love to make their customers smile. In addition to a vibrant YouTube channel that features free sew-alongs on Biani patterns, the shop has lots of special events, including VIP shopping weekends, which include make-and-takes, demos, sales, and more, as well as virtual VIP shopping events. To get information about all of those, be sure to subscribe to their newsletter, and we will put the link up on the screen so that you can do that, or in the comments. Customers who voted for Quilt Sauberry in this year's contest raved about the friendly and helpful staff and great selection. Anya wrote, Ina and her team are very friendly and helpful. She inspires, helps with color selection, and gives great tips and tricks. Since Ina has been doing a lot of streams from her shop, you have the feeling that you are right in the middle and you are going shopping with friends. Stephanie agreed and added, if you order online, you usually have the goods the next day. It is simply the best quilt store in Germany. And Annika shared, the owner and her team work so fast and are client oriented. They try to fulfill all their clients' wishes. It always feels like shopping at a friend's store. I loved learning more about Quilt Sauberry. It looks like a really fun and creative place to visit, and one of these days I am going to get there. So I look forward to meeting all of them. Thank you again to everyone who joined us today. We are going to be back at 2 p.m. next Wednesday 
Mountain Time again, with a really exciting episode of Live with Annie. We have special guests coming to join us in person. So our friends Jamie and Jessica from Sew Tights, who are the makers of the amazing magnetic pins that we all love, are coming to announce a brand new product. And we and they think this is going to be a game changing um, in game changer in the quilting world, in the sewing world, so you are not going to want to miss learning all about that. So mark your calendars now for Wednesday, June 7th, and until then, happy stitching!